next speaker who is uh, Kiri Wagstaff, uh, coming to us from JPL at Caltech, who's going to talk to us about machine assisted discovery through identification and exploration of anomalies in astronomical surveys. Excellent. All right, thanks. It's a pleasure to be here. I will be describing joint work with Eric Huff and Uma Rubber Pagata at Jet Propulsion Laboratory on how we're using machine learning to help us hunt through extremely large astronomical survey data to find what might be interesting and what should be pulled out. And as a case study, what we'll be focusing on is data collected by the Dark Energy Survey, which surveyed 5,000 square degrees of the southern sky using a four meter telescope in Chile. And the result of that observing is a massive catalog of 400 million objects of which about 310 million are galaxies. And there've been a lot of quality filters applied to ensure that this data is very reliable. But even so, as always happens with real data sets, there are still some artifacts and problems that remain within that very large catalog. Yet there is not really time to you know, individually check every single one. But the problem is within that very large data set, if you have polluted observations, it can have adverse impacts on the science you're trying to do with the catalog. So specifically in this catalog, uh, the observations are made at several different bands. We've got the G, R, I, and Z bands that are the ones we're using from about 400 to 400 nanometers up to about one micron. And the goal is among other things to be able to infer um, key parameters that define how our universe operates and how much dark energy and dark matter may be present. And so just as a quick cartoon of what we're doing or what's being done there is if you have a bunch of sources in the sky and they're just sort of randomly distributed, you might have a bunch of point sources like on the left here. However, if you see um, a systematic distortion of the light from those sources where they've been stretched and modified, you might be able to infer that there's some mass even if you can't observe it that's affecting the light from those other sources. So very careful measurements of the shape parameters of those galaxies where their lights uh, being transmitted to us can help us to uh, infer the presence of dark matter. However, if you've got corrupted data in there and some observations that are not trustworthy, you may incorrectly conclude what those uh, parameters are. So it's very important to have highly precise measurements of the objects in the, in the catalog. So our goal was to be able to hunt through this very large catalog to find and understand what artifacts remain that can both help improve the processing pipeline and thereby yield better estimates of cosmological parameters, but potentially also um, focus our attention on strange anomalies that are present but are actually real objects and might be new discoveries. Our approach is broken into three steps. It begins with anomaly detection, of course, within the, the large catalog. But then because it's so big, the sheer number of anomalies you find is also overwhelming for manual review. So we use an organization step to group together similar anomalies so that we can address them collectively. And then finally, we use explanation techniques to highlight what about this group of, of anomalies makes them anomalous. Is it that they're elevated in one particular band in terms of magnitude or is there something else going on that can help characterize what's uh, the problem that has caused them to be anomalous. So the first step of anomaly detection, there are many, many methods out there for doing anomaly or outlier detection. And key questions for us with this task is, first of all, which methods are scalable? Which ones can actually tackle a data set with millions of objects present? And secondly, which ones identify anomalies that are consistent with what a human would have selected as an anomaly within that data set so that it can be a good proxy for our decision process. And I've uh, have illustrations here of three of them just to give you an idea of the different kinds of approaches we looked at. The first one is the isolation forest on the left, which um, does not assume any particular model of the data, but simply looks for basically sparsely populated areas of feature space. So if you just have a two dimensional data set, then what this method does is make a series of random cuts through feature space illustrated by the red lines. And the outlierness of a given object is how many cuts it takes to isolate that into its own little region like here. So you can see that if you're buried in the middle of the distribution, it will take many cuts to isolate. However, if you're out here on the fringe, only a few cuts would be sufficient. 
So you can distinguish between items that are anomalous versus those that are part of the main distribution. The elliptic envelope, conversely, assumes that your data is part of a multi-dimensional Gaussian distribution and forms an envelope around that. And then anything outside of the envelope can be considered an outlier. And then finally, the DMUD method uses a reconstruction error-based approach to model the data in a low dimensional feature space and then see what information can be reconstructed from that. Specifically, it also tries to um, emphasize diversity in the outliers it finds. So it finds one example of an anomaly and the next one it finds should be very different to give you a quick traversal through the types of outliers that are present in the data set. The second and third steps are designed to help us sort through the large number of anomalies that are found and then understand what they are and why they've been identified. So the second step, we looked at both k-means clustering and a self-organizing map to group those outliers into coherent groups. And then we conduct a review process to try to understand why they're anomalous. Uh, we use this web interface to do so where first we look at the uh, the candidate that's been identified, the object which is considered anomalous. And here you're seeing, this is probably small on your screen, but just get the idea, um, visualizations in the G, R, I, and Z bands of this object, color composite that brings that together into one image, as well as the modeled properties of the source, which indicate, again, magnitude at each of those four bands, but it's trying to isolate just the source and not any surrounding objects. We then have automatically generated explanations that highlight which features are anomalous. And here you're seeing a, basically a gap here. This corresponds to the fact that the object is really only present at one of those bands, which is definitely questionable. And we also have coincident observations from Wise and Galax of that same sky position to provide context in case uh, to see what else might have been observed at that part. And then finally, you can make a decision, which this is too small to read, but just it gives you the chance to say, is this actually an interesting object? Is this due to some data problem or is it due to a modeling problem or other issue? And that allows us to classify the different types of anomalies that have been found. So the key question then is asked is which of those anomaly detection methods is most suitable for this problem? And we were very fortunate in this particular situation. The DES catalog was, the initial version was released and then several uh, person years were spent in, in further quality filtering and removing outliers. So we actually can compare our results of automatic analysis of the first version with the millions of objects that were actually removed by a human in the second version and see is there high agreement or not with the automated method. And of the different anomaly methods we looked at, we found that the isolation forest had extremely high agreement with human decisions about outliers. Perfect agreement would be this dashed black line and the isolation forest, it turns out, agreed with human decision-making 96% of the time, which is quite good. So out of a total of 14,000 outliers that were found by the isolation forest, they indeed, 96% of them were also uh, vetted by humans as being things we don't want in the catalog. Of those remaining 4% though, what was going on, right? That translates to four, uh, 538 objects that the isolation forest said were anomalous, but had not been removed independently by human review. So those were the ones we zoomed in on and carefully reviewed every single one because 500 objects is reasonable. It's not millions, right? So we found that actually Two, most of them, minutes. thank you. Most of them were indeed due to modeling or data errors that were, and those subjects should still be removed from the catalog. They just hadn't made, hadn't been removed by humans yet. 9% were normal objects we do want to keep. And 20% were strange things, but looked like real observations that merited further attention. So what do these look like? When I say modeling error, this is an example of where the source has been incorrectly modeled within the observation. For example, the source should always be at the center of this cutout. Yet here we're seeing a hypothesized modeled source, which is probably just um, merging two real sources, but it's not real. And there we've other examples of incorrect source uh, isolation. For data errors, we have examples like these where you see a bright streak in only one color. 
Now these composites are from these different bands and each band was observed at a different time. And so if we see something in only one color, it means it really was only present during that one time when that band was being observed. And so it's a, it's a transient object. We believe these are probably satellite trails that just happen to be passing by when one of the bands was observed. Definitely not the sky object we want to keep. We also have some that appear to be observed in more than one band, but with a shifted location, which means that they were moving between the two uh, bands acquisition. And we believe these are probably just asteroids. They're moving more slowly than the satellite, so they're present in more than one band, but they're also not a sky object we want to keep for this catalog. Of more scientific interest though, we do see some sources that are bright in one band and only one band, but they are co-located with what appears to be a valid um, remote galaxy. And so we think that, again, these are temporally limited events, probably supernovae that are happening within a host galaxy. So those are also of interest for their own reasons. And then we have some mysteries, some remaining items we cannot explain away, but do not appear to be due to data problems or modeling problems such as this object, which appears purple in our visualization. This indicates that it has high magnitude in the um, R and Z bands, but low in the I band. And that's unusual enough that we requested a follow-up observation of this object with the Palomar Observatory. And we're able to obtain a full spectrum for the object, which has a peak here at the oxygen three line. And um, if we match that up with our best um, model galaxy spectrum, which is shown in black here, we find that it's not a very good match. The, very, the best match we have within our, our model zoo of, of known um, galaxy spectra does not model this very well. And our current best guess is that it's a galaxy with an unusually high star formation rate, given the total mm -hmm. mass that's present. And so um, we're still looking into that. So to conclude, this is an approach that allows us to find anomalies in very large catalogs. We've shown this with the dark energy survey, but we see that this can actually be a tool going forward for other large feature surveys that are going to likewise have very large catalogs to analyze. And we would love to see this approach um, performed there as well. So I'll stop there and take any questions you may have. Thank you very much. That was extremely interesting. We do have some questions in the Q&A. Um, Eugene Mengi asks, some very fast asteroids, NEOs, could be as long as the satellite streaks you marked. How long or short could the streak be and in, be included? Um, great point. So, you know, there might not be a, a really true conceptual distinction between these two, two kinds of observation, right? They're both moving objects. And for this purpose, we're not distinguishing between them. We just want to remove all of them as being not galaxies, because that's all we want to retain in the catalog. So I guess sort of my question is sort of related, um, which is, so you're throwing away all these interesting NEOs and asteroids, like your next slide <laughs> had, oh, we find some asteroids, but they're not very interesting. Like, are you tracking these things? Yeah, exactly. Uh, and uh, <laughs> are you, tracking the asteroids as well or recording them or just like yeah, burn in the skies, throw it away? Yeah, great point because and we, we've had talks already on people who actually want to specifically find this kind of object, right? So for the dark energy survey, these are, you know, one man's noise is another man's data, right? So this is not relevant. However, um, I kind of skipped this over this at the end, but we do want to publish the catalogs of the things that were found because other people may get real value out of the, uh, the moving objects, the NEOs, the supernovae and the other things that we're not wanting to be part of the galaxy catalog exactly. So excellent question. All right, Peter Skoda asks, have you tried LOF? Uh, local alloy factor. We, um, for this evaluation, no, although you, you could add, you know, probably five or 10 more methods here for this evaluation. And since we have it set up now to compare with the human review, that it would be very straightforward. Yeah, great idea. Uh, Gabrielle Bien asks, many more satellite trails from Starlink, question mark. I'm sorry, say that again. Are there many more trails from Starlink? Oh, um, I don't know. Okay, so Peter has asked a second um, 
question, but I don't know if it's just a follow-up from his previous one. Is it similar to elliptic envelopes? I don't know, EL, question mark. Um, the LOF, is that similar to elliptic envelope? Maybe that's the question, um, I, I think. <laughs> uh, there's definitely a relation there. And again, with any outlier detection, it's really a question of, you have to make some assumption about what's normal. And then so that you can define what is anomalous with respect to that. There's no objective definition of outlier or anomaly. And so are you going to assume a Gaussian distribution is what's normal? Are you going to assume something else? And that will then define what your outliers become. All right, last question before I move on to the next speaker. I might just have missed this, but was there a comparison done of the different categories of the anomalies between the selection methods? I could some of the methods that didn't match as well as the human filtering perform well with specific kinds of anomalies like data corruption, or was there really not much overlap between the selection sets? Good point. We don't have fine grained um, division of the artifacts, the labeled one when review. We don't have fine grained classification of them into these different error types, so we aren't able to say that. For the ones, um, we could look at just these the smaller subsets. because we've already classified them and see what happens with the different, the, these different methods though. And I think that would be interesting. Thank you very much.